Now I am not an animator by trade necessarily, but today I am because I'm an indie game developer. And if you're an indie game developer and you don't have a huge team, well then when your game needs animation, then you're an animator. <laughs> Um, watch my previous video here if you're interested in how to set up Photoshop for frame animation. That'll walk you through the basics of that. This is going to be a little bit more about the actual form and how to get some fluid motion with your characters in Photoshop. Now you'll notice that I have each of these frames set up to correspond to one of the layers that I have and then all the other layers are invisible. So what we do is we go down to probably like say the first frame and I already have that sort of that keyframe image of what I know it's going to look like but I'm going to start with just the the stick figure fluid motion of one of these sets of limbs so for instance I would do both of the arms at the same time or in this case I'm starting with the legs and I will go to the next frame and then I sort of onion skin this stick figure uh, over the previous frame and then I go to the next layer up and then I set that previous layer, the, the one below it to maybe like a lighter opacity or sometimes I don't even need to do that. I just kind of, because I'm just doing like the stick figure thumbnail of the motion. And when you're doing something like this, you want to move incrementally. If a line moves a great distance between frames, that means it's going to actually move very fast when it's played back. But if there's very subtle difference between frames, it'll move very slowly. And this is something that you can get a feel for by doing little flip books. And when I was in high school, I used to do this a lot where I would buy the, those uh, post-it notes or the little uh, flashcards. And then I would just draw out like stick figures fighting. And just by practicing these stick figures, uh, spinning their legs and turning their hips, you can see this movement as you flip through the pages or through the, the frames. By switching on the visibility of each layer per frame, we're simulating the experience of flipping like you would with your thumb through a flip book. And so I would do it in kind of groups like this, starting out with the, the legs because that's where the weight is shifting. Now this is a character who's mid-air and they're shifting their weight from the, the back leg that slowly gets lifted up as it progresses through frames and then uh, setting itself up to land on its, uh, it will be its left leg, but it's the leg that we're seeing on the right as it'll land on that leg. And when I've got the full sequence of all 12 frames, set up for that leg motion. Then I start going through and filling in where the shoulder and the torso would be. Because he's moving in an upward motion, his arms are gonna drag down a little bit because he's moving up. In fact, his hair will pull down, his clothing will pull down a little bit because there's a little bit of lag on things like cloth and it's the muscle that's thrusting the character up into the air. And then once it reaches the apex of the jump is when we'll raise that arm up because this is the point at which everything shifts from being thrust into the air fighting gravity to now it's being pulled as the body begins to fall. Now we don't have a lot of vertical movement because it, with game development, your sprites are not actually moving. They're attached to, sort of think of it like a, a pin. They're pinned to the collision box. And so when the character is, is falling, they're act not actually moving at all. They're attached to this object that's moving and that's the collision box. And so uh, in the case of the animation, you'll notice that the arms begin to fall up. That's not the best way to put it, but you have to think of it like the body is dropping and anything like cloth, a scarf, hair, arms are gonna go up because uh, they're gonna lag behind the falling body. Just like if you had a, a, a piece of cloth tied to a tennis ball, that piece of cloth, as it was dropping the ball, was dropping, the cloth would be dangling above it, flapping in the wind. And so that's what I'm trying to simulate. And you'll notice how uh, after, you know, I make a few significant changes to the stick, uh, stick man that I've got going on here, I start to just kind of go back and play through it. Like, is this getting a fluid motion? When it's a stick figure, that's the time to figure out, do I need to really jut that leg out a little bit more? Or is the are the arms falling before the legs start falling? You know, like notice that his arms flap way out once he's really at the apex of that. I might even need to cut some frames. I might decide, ah, it's just, it's, it's going too slow. I need to make it go faster. So I might cut frames because fewer frames means it's gonna be more punchy. It's gonna be, it's gonna move faster. And then now that I've got my, my motion in place, my stick figure kind of works. I, I know that this is gonna be a fluid motion. It looks like I'm 
just up to about what nine, eight or nine frames. But I decided that I wanted to add the falling aspect, uh, which is this is a, it's kind of a separate animation in the engine that I'm using. Generally, it's broken apart into two animations. There's the, the jumping and then there's the falling. Um, these are two separate animations, but they need to fluidly work together. And of course, the player can interrupt any of this at any time to do an attack, which jumps to the attack animation. You can do in-betweens, but regardless, I decided to add more frames. And then I started with the cloth uh, from his scarf just dangling uh, above him. Now, if you're trying to keep your animation simple, don't do that. Don't have hanging cloth, <laughs> um, because if it's wrong, people are gonna really notice it, um, you know, uh, or if it's too stiff or anything like that. So it really helps if it's small, um, and it, it helps if your, your character is also kind of small, uh, because otherwise you need a lot more frames of animation. The bigger your character is, the more frames of animation you need. And we've got some pretty big characters in this game, so. Uh, ultimately, that's why we have to do a combination of both hand-drawn and uh, spine animation. But uh, you can see how the as the player uh, jumps or as the character leaps into the air, uh, they will also, you'll see this uh, the movement of the moment where it reaches the apex is when the cloth begins to flip from being pulled down uh, to now it's being uh, flapping above the character's head. And the same thing will have to happen with hair. The same thing will have to happen if he's holding something, like uh, if you've got a character that's like holding something like that would be flapping in the wind that's lightweight. Uh, so you kind of have to think about the weight of everything. That's what's kind of fascinating about animation. And something that, you know, like I said, I'm self-taught. I'm not like, it's not like I'm following some crazy ass principles, you know, of generations of animators being passed down. These are simple 2D animations for an indie game. It's like, um, can't specialize in everything, right? It'd be nice if I could hire a, an animator that does all hand frame animation and can draw like me too. But for the time being, you work with the resources you got. And I think a lot of, a lot of you folks out there that are following my channel, you're do it yourself types as well and very resourceful. You have to be, if you're going to make, you know, uh, uh, indie games on a shoestring budget, or if you don't have millions of dollars to just, you know, throw at other people to do the job for you, but you do your best with what you got in this case. Uh, so the next step that I do is I'll, I'll start filling in flats, like the solid colors. And it helps really helps a lot that the character is kind of simple for these, uh, frame by frame animations. You notice I'll do one part at a time right now. I'm filling in the scarf there and the scarf throughout the whole frame progression. Now I'm switching over to filling in the pants and I may not get it right. I may not get it perfect, but I'm using that stick figure as my framework for the movement. And that also every frame sort of helps me remind me like, oh, okay. So this is the part where the pants kind of get a little bit bigger because they're getting inflated with air as he's beginning his descent, you know? And this is the point at which his other leg is kind of dropping below his front leg, you know? And uh, this, is, this is also the position of the belt. And we're beginning, you'll see as I play it back, we're beginning to start to see the character forming throughout all of these frames. And of course, keep in mind, if you go crazy detailed with these, man, you got a lot of work ahead of you because you got to do the flats and then you got to go in with multiple layers of detailing to make sure that your detailing is animating correctly with the flow of the character. There's like going to be a lot of the work that goes into this game and into these animations that most people will never see unless they're watching it in slow motion. And as I'm getting lost in every frame, I'm like drawing the character multiple times here and my stick figures act as my framework for the pose and the momentum. Um, and, and even as I go in and start to do add my line art and try to keep the same thickness of the line art. And by the way, you do not want to be trying to figure out your character design while you're doing this. Uh, no, you do not. <laughs> because if you change your character design, you got to redraw every one of those frames. You know, that's the downside of doing frame by frame animation and why a lot of uh, indie games will just do puppet animation because they can just swap out uh, art assets uh, on the fly uh, using the same skeleton, the same animation. You do the animation once with these bones and then you can swap out the, the head or the legs or the pants or the gear. But puppet animation, like spine animation, can sometimes look a little too mechanical, and some people really don't like that look. But maybe I'll do a video about puppet spine animation later. 
So I use the liquify tool on the hair here so that I can flap it up so that it looks like it's beginning to fall. And the liquify tool is actually really useful for distorting your shapes uh, with this frame by frame animation technique, specifically with Photoshop. And people who watch my channel already know how to use the liquify tool. <laughs> I only talk about it like all the time, man. So now it's probably like an hour in and I'm starting to reach the point where I know what my frames look like and now it's about it's about just drawing in the character uh, in that new pose uh, for each one of these frames. So you'll see me kind of zipping through the frames and then I'll go back and I'll I'll just hit play on that and test it like oh there's a maybe am I making the pants look big enough? I think it at one point I realized ah oh, the pants don't look big enough. And you gotta watch that movement because if you suddenly make the pants really big in one frame and it's not consistent with the, the character design or with the movement of the previous frames, then it looks really awkward and out of place. And you might even at this point decide if you wanted to add another frame in between, if it feels like your, your frames are not fluid. Um, I keep a very tight ship on my process, <laughs> as you can tell. Uh, it's very, very methodical with my process here. Uh, so much of my relationship with art and with uh, creating art assets for games is this iterative process. I start with a blob and then I sculpt it. Throw something out, you just get something out there. So you, you, at least you beat the white bull, at least you're not afraid. And then you look at what it is and where you're at with it and then you evaluate. Can I make that better? Can I improve that? And um, usually the answer is yes. And that's a wonderful, beautiful thing. You guys know me on my channel. I always talk about that. Just throw yourself kind of, you know, down the mountain and you figure out how to ski on the way down. You know, uh, I don't want to go through two years of training before I, I, you know, just in animation before I, I get to make my game. It's like if I have to redraw this animation later uh, or hire somebody later, uh, then that so be it. But at least I will have something uh, that I can learn from and evaluate and do a, you know, I can, I can look at it and go, oh, well, my uh, animation with, uh, you know, characters maybe isn't as strong and maybe I should do a couple of little tutorials and lessons and identify, I can identify where the problem is if I have some example of where I'm at, a barometer to know uh, what might have worked and what might not have worked. And, and then you can identify those things and improve them. And man, those of you out there that have tried to do like maybe like direct an animated film or um, make an indie game or something, you know what I'm talking about. You gotta wear a lot of hats, you gotta do a lot of things. And uh, if, if you don't just dive in, you're never gonna do it. So by this point, you can begin to evaluate. I'm playing this back at like one time speed here. And a lot more of the character details are falling into place and you can kind of see a little bit of lag on the scarf. I wanted that to feel like it's got some weight so it covers up a little bit more of his face while he's uh, while he's jumping. And then at the apex, it's still kind of up over his face. And then as he's falling, he will it will almost cover a lot of his face except for just his eyes, you see there, and then uh, start to fill in like, oh, well, this is like free falling. There's a moment at which his feet are shifting the weight and he's anticipating landing on his other leg also to evaluate it, I added the movement, the vertical movement to the character, knowing very well I'll have to just move that back. And as you progress through this and you get to like, you know, hour two or hour three of working on, I think it was about three hours to do this animation. And once you get to that point, it's like, okay, so now it's time to just start making sure that there's cool little details in there and that the details are fairly consistent across all the frames. Make sure your colors are consistent across all the frames. Make sure that like when you get to that apex, like the hair or cloth or anything that might dangle above him is up there along the top. And then, um, you know, you'll see me like start to play, do the playback and then making sure that shadows, shadows are like the last thing I do, details or shadows to make sure that they're consistent across all the frames. And there you have it. It took, yeah, like I said, about three and a half, maybe four hours to do this animation. And I think it's pretty good. I think it's pretty, you know, solid. I mean, I still have to do the version where he's holding the pillar, but uh, here's how it looks in game. Uh, not too shabby, not too bad. It matters a lot how it transitions into the other animations. And I think it, it serves its purpose. It does okay. We did recently switch to Unreal Engine and I'll probably do a video on that soon. Until then, don't forget to uh, head on over to Steam and uh, don't forget to wishlist 
Twilight Monk. This is a Metroidvania, hand-drawn Metroidvania. Lots of cool art, lots of story. Uh, if you'd like to read the story of Twilight Monk to catch up on the characters, the game is a sequel to the novels, and there are two 50,000-word novels over on Amazon. You can get those in paperback or ebook if you have a Kindle subscription. It's totally free. There's also an art book, and you can check that out as well. If you'd like to know more about drawing, just digital art in general, or making art for games, you can check out my free digital artist starter kit, as well as some of my more advanced uh, tutorials over there on my Gumroad channel. And of course, I'm here every uh, Friday, so don't forget to leave your comments and questions below. However, I only read comments from subscribers, so don't forget to subscribe, and I will see you guys in the next video. All right, ciao.